William Irwin. All right, we got William Irwin, author of The Meaning of Metallica, who ride the lyrics. I really love this book, man. I've been seeing your books in bookstores and the subject of intrigued me, this philosophy of things that we kind of take for granted in a way is how I felt. Hey, thanks, Brett. I appreciate you having me on the show. Please call me Bill. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I've got this whole series of books on uh, pop culture and, and philosophy. And what, one of the earlier ones was Metallica and philosophy. And that was a joint effort with a whole bunch of my philosophy friends to get different takes on, uh, on philosophy and, uh, and Metallica. Uh, this book was my, my solo effort, uh, diving into really just focusing on the lyrics and taking the lyrics uh, as something on their own and, and, you know, diving deep into them as, as poetry, as therapy, as philosophy, and, and really trying to get behind them. Yeah. And, and what I really love is, as I started, as deep as it gets, the way you set it up, it reminds me of going, whether it's a sports game with your friends, a Springsteen concert, the bond that this... The, arguing over these things these bands that are so close to our heart makes and also that you and your 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 best friend go in the same way I went in with things in my life you go in on a second album and then work backwards we all went in we're the same age I'm 52 you know so yeah. same relative you dropped in and then you got to work backwards like Motley Crue I dropped in at Shout at the Devil then you work you know you know what I mean it's an interesting place to drop in because it was word of mouth back then Oh, yeah, it's what word of mouth. And uh, I, I always feel like and I think no matter what age you are, you feel like maybe you, you missed the golden age by a couple of years. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, to, to have been there when when Metallica first hit with with Kill Em All. I mean, I'm, I'm from Yonkers. I know you're from Jersey and yeah. Metallica played some of their very earliest shows. Uh, well, you know, one of them was in Dover, New Jersey, not far from you. One, one was in uh in Yonkers, actually, at a place called uh, the Rising Sun that I used to hang out outside of when I was too young to get in. And uh, yeah, so it seems like maybe that was the golden age. But then you talk to people four or five years older and they're like, well, I just missed, you know, this particular Sabbath tour or something like that. So, I mean, uh, yeah. you know, th there were plenty of golden ages to be part of. You know, it's weird growing up by Old Bridge and the Metal Militia. I yeah. didn't see them then, but they played our skating rink, Sports 9, um, with the All for One tour. And the reason I learned that is when I was 17, I met Hetfield in Hollywood at a Sam Kinison show. And I asked him and he barked at me and was like, really me? To the point that <laughs> Brett Michaels took me with. And I've met him about four times in my life. And they've all been four completely different dudes. Uh -huh. And the last time I met him really was at a Rocket from the Crypt show when he just had his first kid drinking uh, a non-alcoholic beer and he couldn't have been any kinder. You could just see the evolution of him as a person. That's what, it, you know, you definitely see an evolved human being. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of your, uh, your encounter. It was scary as a kid. It was scary as it didn't feel good at the time, but in hindsight to see the, the, wow, this guy's down to the hug we saw just a few days ago. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah, no. All right. I mean, the guy is totally, uh, evolved and there was just this uh, incredible uh, armor that he was wearing, emotional armor, you know, keeping people at a distance and, and that kind of thing. I mean, I didn't get as close as that, uh, but I relate in the story getting strand in the, in the book, uh, getting stranded outside the Meadowlands after the Aussie concert uh, and just being able to, you know, see them get out of the tour bus, maybe 15 feet away. And the other guys are sort of smiling and having fun. And, you know, he was just radiating anger and alienation and all that stuff that I felt too. But, you know, I, I felt it at the, uh, the 16 year old level. And here was this grown man at 23, uh, you know, radiating it. And, and wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it's a crazy thing. And why do you think, because this is just something I thought my whole life. Because and being where East Coast a Springsteen fan, I love like one of my favorites, really favorites. Why doesn't people don't people like David Lee Roth, um, James Hetfield get uh, get credit for their level? And I know it's different, right? You might not love the Van Halen lyrics. I do. I think they are just as good. Mean Streets is just as good as Born to Run. Why don't these guys get credit? They almost get dismissed for their lyric writing, whereas someone like Springsteen or Dylan gets just on a pedestal, these guys get no credit, really. It's not even acknowledged that they write lyrics. 
Ab- absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, and th- there, I mean, there are a couple of things going on there. I think one of, one of them is generational, right. And guys like us are finally sort of aging into, uh, a place where, you know, listen, I can write a book uh, about Hetfield's lyrics and be a college professor. And uh, I mean, people don't really bat an eye quite the way that they would have when, when I started out doing this kind of stuff with philosophy and pop culture 20 years ago. Uh, so part of it is generational, but also there, there's a kind of an elitism and a snobbery and, and a classism that goes on, right? Where, yeah. you know, gr- growing up uh, our age in, in high school, uh, I mean, uh, the, most of the college bound boys uh, were listening to U2 and The Cure and, and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, so it, you still see that snobbery in the, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and institutions oh, yeah. like that. It's, it's just nauseating, right? Yeah, Where yeah. Uh, our music uh, can't be serious, uh, can't be taken seriously. And so, you know, I've been on sort of a personal mission for for a long time and with this book in particular to show that this music deserves to be taken seriously and uh well i mean it's been done with with springsteen and and dylan etc and you can argue about uh about their lyrics and you know are they on some sort of higher level And, and maybe they are i'm not sure uh that that's the case taste is largely subjective uh but there's there's a great deal of depth uh, th- that's going on in, in Hetfield's lyrics. And uh, I mean, there's a, a sort of poetry in, uh, in Roth's lyrics as well, which is a different kind of thing. Great poetry. Uh, I, I yeah. worked with the guy, Kim Fowley. I don't have to form the run. It was any talk. He definitely had worked with all of those people somehow touched it. And it's street poetry that connects. It's, it's street, something from street that connects. Yeah, sure, sure. And, and I mean, that's become recognized with, with rap music. Yeah. Uh, and, and fine, all, all power to it. Some of that I like, some of it I don't, but I recognize this value in it. Uh, you know, but we, we as a group sort of still get dissed, you know, the fans of this music. Now, do you think, as I read your book, it made me really think, how aware do you think he is? And I know you don't know, because you're not in his head, but how aware do you think he is of Nietzsche, these things that he's that, like that he's pulling off? How aware is Hetfield of what he's doing? I, I don't think that he's super aware of some of the comparisons that, that I might make, you know, with like Freud or Nietzsche or that kind of thing. Uh, but you don't need to be. Uh, he, he's drawing on human experience which is the same uh, very much from the ancient Greeks through Shakespeare, through Nietzsche, uh, through our day. I mean, many times the wheel's been reinvented uh, poetically and human experience at its core is, is still very much the same, but it gets rearticulated in different contexts and different cultures. Uh, and so, I mean, I think he's, he's a deep thinker uh, in, in many ways and a, and a gifted poet. And there are things that he's quite familiar with, like, you know, particularly early on, having been raised uh, in a very strictly Christian scientist household, uh, he drew on lots of biblical imagery, which right, right. was drummed into him. Okay, uh, yeah. You know, and in other cases, he's taken inspirations from movies, whether it's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or Johnny Got His Gun. Uh, and in many cases, really gone beyond uh, what was in the original text you know so he's interpreting it and putting his own spin on it yeah it's it's amazing and and um another thing that that you i love how you you don't start from album one and go to the end you just paint the whole picture of how the psyche works and this is definitely like i feel like you get in him you know i mean because people ignore the hard wires when when they when they're a drive-by fan they ignore that those Kiss dynasties or unmasked are such a part of the story. One of my favorite things you talk about is the, I think it's, yeah, St. Anger. Everybody bitched about that broke sounding snare, but you had a broke band. I got chills (laughs) reading that. You thought that was so cool. That against, you know, the lyrics was wild. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, uh, particularly in in, in retrospect, I I think I even felt that way at the time, that the broken sounding snare fit a broken uh, band and it, and it just sort of mirrored what they were about emotionally at that time and 
uh, really what I try to do the book with the book, and I appreciate your, your highlighting that, is, is it's not a catalog of here's the, the first song on the first album, and this is what I think it's about, etc. Uh, it's, it's more like uh, a conversation that, that's going on, the kind of conversation, as you, might, as you mentioned, that you might have about sports or about Springsteen or whatever it is that you're into, uh, with friends where one sort of thing leads to another, but you stay on topic. So the book is broken down thematically where I talk about the songs that are on, uh, on the subject of religion, the subject of war, the subject of addiction, the subject of freedom, uh, and on and on. There, there are 10 different chapters. And, and you see the way that uh, one song speaks to the next. And as you mentioned, from your experience of having met Petfield, four different times over a very long period of time, you, you see the way in which uh, he evolves personally. Uh, and you mentioned uh, just before the, uh, the hug, uh, there were, you know, for people who uh, aren't aware of uh, the absolute current events of Metallica, they're playing down in Brazil and uh, he is feeling really vulnerable and really uh, insecure about his playing, right? He's, he's famed for his down picking guitar playing, which is very difficult to do, particularly at a, for, a, at, for a guy who's now 59 years old and uh, didn't think he could, uh, could do it. And uh, the fans lifted him up. But even before that, the band backstage had lifted him up. And as he's actually saying this on stage, the guys in the band come around and uh, give him a hug. And it's, it's a nice moment. It's not cheesy. But that kind of vulnerability, uh, despite his really rough exterior, has been there at least since Ride the Lightning. And it gets more and more personal uh, as the albums go by, particularly into the Black Album and the Load era. Yeah. Yeah. No, like you say, and, and I saw a video speaking of that vulnerability from yelling at me as a kid. Do you see that video where they're running on stage and he sees a little kid and he literally runs back to give the kid a, like, it like catches his eye. You go, that's real. That wasn't like he didn't think about that. Just his heart fluttering a different way than it used to. You know, what I mean, it's very hard to move the needle in life. And here's a guy that's moved the needle. It oh, it really is. Yeah, I mean, uh, th they've always been about authenticity, uh, but it, but authenticity uh, has been about changing and not staying the same thing. Not staying. Uh, the whatever 23 year old who, who barks at a fan, right? Uh, yeah. but, but who's grown uh, and changed uh, and been vulnerable. Uh, and you know, he, he's, he's become uh, a kinder, gentler, softer version uh, of, of who he was. But I have no doubt that the, some of the fury and the anger and the scars oh, yeah. uh, are still there. And then he lets them come out in, uh, in the writing process. Well, I, I believe it. And I do really, I was looking at that hug. That didn't seem phoned in. Many people would phone that in. I go, that seems really pretty real, man. That that didn't seem phoned in when he melted down on stage. That he wasn't feeling it and felt old. That that really felt sincere. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it, that that's not like something that he uh, is going to trot out and repeat again. That was a one-off. And uh, it, it seemed spur of the moment, right? That That really he did feel lifted up by the fans and he did feel the gratitude for... Uh, his bandmates and uh, he is at least uh, to the best of my knowledge newly sober again uh, or you know hopefully for a year or more at, at, at this point and I think that may has made a big difference in his life and uh, in taking stock in himself and yeah you know, and we're good on him and when you talk about it, I was thinking when you were talking with the friend when you think of James Hetfield who doesn't cancel shows and towards getting sober I'm thinking that wasn't three beers at Applebee's that sent him to getting sober. It had to be a very big Dante's descent of some sort to just to, to cancel shows. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. They basically canceled the whole uh, Australian tour. Right. So, uh, it, yeah, no, I mean, when he fell, he fell hard. I've, I've, I've been sober 25 years myself, and uh, I've, I've paid quite a bit of attention to his uh, thoughts yeah. about uh, addiction from uh, you know, when he was struggling with it and in denial about it himself on onward. And uh, it, it, it's uh, an unfortunate, but unfortunate, but common enough experience when, when a guy with uh, with long term sobriety or a woman goes back to it. 
uh, it's not three beers at Applebee's, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they really uh, descend pretty quickly and they don't always uh, recover, but he seems to be really back on his feet. Yeah. Um, I think that, that, that uh, you, you not, I don't drink either. Like maybe that's why this book really resonated with me is you see how that mindset works. Like, I love where you go, like he's writing master of puppets about Coke addiction while he has this alcohol addiction to almost point it that it's, that level deep that you need to go to to understand where this guy's at and you oh, just I, explore as a possible i love that part that yeah no i i think so right i mean and this is just what 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 people do when they're in the in the midst of uh of an addiction right you always look for the person uh, who's worse and i know i always justified uh you know my drinking about well i'm not as bad as that guy right and uh if 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 you're among the worst of the drinkers then you start looking well at least i'm not a cocaine addict look at those yeah guys, yeah right? yeah <laughs> and, and the big Coors light move that i've seen many times with yeah. rock stars is, no, I, i'm just gonna drink Coors light it's like water but you know I'm, there's certain guys there's a drink in your hand it's on and he's one. Oh, oh yeah no right and and once you get a couple of cores lights and you you your you know your resistance to indulging in something else you know is way down and and it's off to the races from there yeah the, another another one that i love that you talk about in a lot of the lyrics is like one word can change everything and i love that in in a song like it's not it's life of death, not life or death. And to me, that really, when someone does that, that blows my mind. Or one word totally changes. And he's very aware of those one word moves. Yeah, that's right. So that, that's a lyric from Master of Puppets that you're, uh, that you're referencing there. And on a casual uh, listen, it sounds like the, the lyric is life or death becoming clearer, which is kind of, you know, sort of just a, a cliche uh, sort of thing. Oh, it was do or die. Yeah, but uh in the uh in the telling of the story in master of puppets it's life of death becoming clearer right and so in other words the guy is basically like the living dead uh zombie uh with uh his addiction sort of uh calling the, the shots and marching him towards the end yeah it, it, it's it's just so cool i, I mean all these how did you organize this because it because because the thread was it hard to organize the the, the thread well, I mean, it, it, in a way, I've, I've been thinking about this since I'm 14, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been yeah, the soundtrack yeah. uh, of, of my life. And so all these ideas are running through my head. And I've had uh, however many conversations with people who I've talked too long about this stuff for. So in a way, uh, it, was, it was there, which isn't to say that it was easy to write. Uh, but oddly enough, I didn't set out to write a book about Metallica when I was doing this. I was uh, writing about uh, this book, Educated by Tara Westover, which is about her experience growing up in a fundamentalist Mormon community. Uh, and I started quoting from Hetfield and referencing his uh, upbringing in Christian science and one thing led to another and it turned out, you know, I was writing something that wasn't about that book uh, educated, but I'm, I have this thing about Hetfield. And that, uh, so one thought led to the other writing about the, the various uh, aspects of his commentary on religion. And then I said, well, well you know, this leads to talking about uh, addiction and that led to the next. So I was just having fun with it uh, and, you know, it developed into something more. Yeah, because. All right. I, I love how you break it down into religion, addiction, insanity, death, justice, freedom, isolation, control, and resilience. Those are the chapters. And it definitely feels like you get a big chunk of who this guy is. And, and nobody knows who anybody is for sure, but you got a pretty good shot at, 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 at the picture, I think. Well, yeah, it, 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 it's my take on it. And uh, as I say in, in the book, and as I say to anybody listening to this, uh, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, a, a good book should be a conversation starter and not a conversation ender. And that, that's yeah. what I intend this, uh, this book to be. So you read the book or you're listening to the podcast and you think I've left something out or I got something wrong. Great. I want to hear from you. Uh, you know, I give my email address and my, my Twitter handle and, uh, great. Let's, you know, uh, let's connect, let's converse. That's great. That I, I think really good authors do that. Chuck Posterman went Fargo Rock City. I don't know if you remember that book. I really yeah, like yeah. that book. One of the early rock books. And uh, he put his phone number in there. As Did a kid, he? I call, oh, hey, yeah, he I doesn't do that anymore, I don't think. Though. No, no. I was on the phone with him talking about, yeah. 
yeah. it, it, it's uh so tell me about the podcast i didn't know about the podcast uh, i'm sorry what, what, did you have a podcast did you say oh no no no, oh, I'm, no, no, no. I, I'm, I guess i was calling your show a podcast oh, oh my yeah 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 okay yeah isn't, but yeah isn't. but people people right. can can no no it is the same thing and um another one that was blown my mind was so uh all these bands headfields dealt with so much religion confusion all the he never became a satanic metal band and everybody else was that blew my right. mind i was like wait he could have so easily went that way. What do you think that was? Just too much depth? Well, yeah, I think so. And, and he had a real commitment to avoiding cliches uh, from very early on, even though he was a big fan of Venom and Merciful Fate and th those kind of guys. And he had real animus toward uh, uh, organized religion, that kind of thing. You know, he really wanted to avoid. I mean, th there are bands, like you mentioned, Van Halen, that, that take a cliche and, and, and make it work, right? Like party music and hot girls and, and that Well, that was a part thing. of life. That's a, they documented that well. They documented California well to me then. They, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, being you know, on the never, East Coast, they painted us a picture of what California could be. Hell yeah, right? You know, uh, they, they, but, but to just imitate that wasn't anything that he was going to do, right? Uh, and... Yeah, so I mean, even uh, even stuff like fast cars. Uh, the, the only that's why, uh, and he's a car nut, right? That's why one of my least favorite songs is is you know a favorite of some people, Fuel. Which oh, is, I love uh, Fuel. You hate Fuel in this book. I was. Like, I know. I, I hate on it. People are gonna hate on me for hating on it, but right, it it, it uh, partly because it, you know he makes such an exception to his rule of avoiding a cliche, right? Uh, there is a song which really just is about, you know, that the adrenaline rush of driving fast. Uh, and, you know, that might be fine for someone else, but that's the kind of thing that he's studiously avoided from pretty early on. Well, I think when you talk about a broke band at that era, what I, you know, they start, they're on the same page. They, a band can't be anymore. We are going here. This yeah. is the vision missions. At that point, James wanted to be in the stray cats and drive, you know, <laughs> old cars Kirk wanted to collect horror magazines. Um, Lars wanted to collect art. And uh, Jason just wanted to be in Metallica. Yeah. yeah you know what a I nice mean? Way of summing it up. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? And, it, and Jason gets kicked out to get yeah. back on point. You yeah. Know, just such a complex band. No, that, that that's right. But that they've kept it together. And of course, one of the gripes uh, that fans have is that uh, the albums come so few and far between. But they're not just cranking out the sausage. And, and when you get something, it's, it's something kind of new and kind of different. It may not be your, uh, your favorite, but it is uh, about where they are at that time. Yeah. I, I think the great, the greats, and I, I just keep saying Springsteen because I, I, that that's the longest one in my life, you know, you're a Jersey which, guy. That's why. Yeah. 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 But I do love like, uh, and Guns N' Roses is probably yeah. one of my, and I, 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 I know every little lyrical twist and, I feel like I probably like you with James. I know his psyche better than he knows his psyche. I'm like, <laughs> Izzy tricked him into singing that song about the band atrophy. And he doesn't even know what he's singing there. But it, it, it's just, it's I, I lost my train of thought of just just no oh just 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 knowing someone's psyche and just they need three years oh three years between albums to really get that meaty thing of this is where I'm at. Yeah. And no, I think so. And, yeah. and it's worth the wait at this point, I think, really. Yeah. Uh, and if you like, yeah, if you if you love a band like I love guns and people love just ripping apart to use your illusions. Yeah. But that's the sound of the band. Atrophy. You know what I mean? If you really start listening, you sure. know, and, and, and that I mean, I would have loved more parts of the story. But with Metallica, we're, we're talking about probably the biggest rock band ever or the biggest I mean, I think bigger, I was talking about something probably bigger than a Springsteen and and uh, still going, you know, like when we were kids, who do we hear about? It was like, we never saw him, but Zeppelin, Zeppelin, all the older kids, right, maybe someone right. had seen Zeppelin. Yeah, that but was this is age. like, yeah, this is like, this hasn't stopped. This has kept going our whole life. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, when you, you think about the way in which bands continue, at least some bands and Metallica is, you know, 40 years going now. I mean, nobody thought that 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 a band could last that long, right? And and be anything maybe but a novelty act. But but it's kept going. 
I was listening uh, to, to the uh, Sergeant Peppers uh, the other day with my son in the car, you know, and the lyric comes on, it was 20 years ago today. And I, I'm saying to my son, I remember when that song was 20 years old in 1987 and thinking 20 years ago, years ago was ridiculous, yes. right? Oh and now my that's God. like 35 years since then, <laughs> you know? I totally, know. They, there was an Iggy Pop song, Candy, and it was 20 years, and it just yeah. seemed like, was Abraham Lincoln alive right, then? Right. You know what I mean? Like right. four score and 20 years ago, right? Yeah, yeah man. And other little things like the leper messiah go why they did take that from Bowie. So many cool little things, man, in this, you know? Yeah, yeah. There are some nuggets to uncover, right? I mean, really diehard fans will know something like, uh, for me, like who, Leper Messiah, you know, came from uh the uh, the David Bowie song. But uh yeah, it, the the mystery of why and how that got in there, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I get into in the book. Yeah, the, the ride the lightning from Stephen King, right? Right. You know, and yeah. I have to. I have to. I had to start with you know, like anything. You start like you start having a Wikipedia to go. Is this right? And then after about your seventh one, you're like, all right, he's he's not lying. <laughs> <laughs> I did some fact checking. I don't doubt that some somebody will find a mistake or two in there, and that's why I say get in touch with me. Tell me to you know what I what I goofed on or left out and. Maybe there'll be a second edition and I fix that and you get the credit for uh, for telling me about it. And, uh, you know, just keep the conversation going. Right. I mean, it's like you say, you have you have these great conversations with friends about sports or music or whatever it may be. It matters to you and you derive meaning from it. And, you know, this is just another way of keeping that going. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Before we go, I, I want to talk about the end of where you talk about that. The conversation's still going to go when you and your friends, like me and my buddies, it's just, we're having friends at this age that you've had for a while. I think some of this music has kept us friends. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's a bond, right? Even yeah. though other things in our lives have changed, different careers, live in different places, et cetera. Uh, so I referenced my friend Joe a couple of times uh, in the book, was my best friend growing up. We're still good friends. And you know, we live in different states and only see each other every year or two at this point. But I mean, the music is one of the things that will always connect us. Uh, and I, you know, I say in, in closing the book and speculating about the, the Metallica music and lyrics to come, we don't know exactly what it'll be. And not every new album uh, is my favorite, but every new album is like seeing my old friend again. Uh, and I might like the 1986 version of my friend better than the 2022 version, but I'll take it. Uh, totally, and, totally. You know, there you well, go, right? So well, but well, Bill, thank you, and hang out so I can say goodbye to you. The Meaning Metallica, Ride the Lyrics, out now by William Irwin. I'll put a link in the chat, and uh, thanks for stopping by. Cool. Thanks for having me, Brett. Yeah.